My name is Shannon Stewart, and I'm a psychologist by background. Um, I used to uh, work for the Ministry of Children and Youth Services in um, Ontario. And uh, about four years ago, I became an uh, um, associate professor at Western University. And it's a large um, university within southwestern uh, um, Ontario. And so that's where I am currently. And I've been an NRI fellow. Um, I became involved in uh, NRI probably back in 2009. And I've been working on a suite of instruments for children and youth since that time. So this suite um, is essentially the newest in the instrument development. And so I'll be um, providing you with uh, an overview of what instruments are in the children's instrument. And then in addition to that, I'm going to uh, show a bit of data um, on different uh, service sectors to give you an idea of a comparison uh, across multiple uh, organizations and service sectors in terms of the differences in uh, triggering algorithms for collaborative action plans. Right? Great. So, um, so if you look at uh, children's mental health uh, in Ontario and in the United States, one in five children have a mental health problem significant enough to cause major uh, serious functioning problems in school, uh, in the community, um, as well as at home. And so those are pretty staggering um, uh, uh, statistics given the situation because there just aren't enough resources to go around to provide services for one in five children. So we need to um, understand uh, what this means as uh, only about a quarter of the kids who actually receive uh, or require service actually receive it. And so if this was a situation with respect to cancer, there would be um, an outcry. Uh, and yet um, very few children, despite the fact that they require it, actually receive the services that they need. And we know that mental health problems are highly predictive of a variety of different issues in terms of uh, school dropout, major mental health issues, uh, conflict with the law, uh, difficulties with peer relationships, uh, aggressive tendencies, and the like. And so it also increases the likelihood that they're going to engage in substance use problems. So what we, were, we are very interested in doing is actually developing uh, instruments prov to provide early intervention and prevention, as well as identify those at highest risk. And what we want to do is enhance uh, mental health services for very young, vulnerable uh, children so that we can circumvent chronic, problematic issues later in life. And we know that for every dollar that you actually spend in early intervention, you actually save $10 in more chronic deep end services. So the payoff is quite high if we can identify these kids early so that we can uh, change the developmental pa pathway and trajectory. So we also have, similar to some of the information that you received uh, this morning, is collaborative action plans. So uh, these are evidence informed care plans that assist in knowledge mobilization and transfer in the field to identify uh, issues so that they can, uh, so that clinicians have the necessary information at their fingertips to provide good evidence informed practice. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the NRI Child and Youth Suite. Also provide you some information on what we do with scales and how uh, agencies and organizations use it in the field. And then um, summarize the, the measurements that we utilize uh, within the suite of instruments. And then I'm going to give you some examples of some caps that are triggered across different service sectors. So as you have heard this morning, in each instrument actually is for a specific uh, sub uh, sector uh, with a particular vulnerable <coughs> vulnerability and need, uh, but they integrate nicely so that they share a common core assessment instrument so that you can compare and contrast uh, children, youth and adults across uh, the lifespan as well as uh, across service sectors. And they talk to one another so you can share that information so that uh, it reduces uh, the likelihood that you have to reassess over and over again. In Ontario, it's been indicated that 
on average, children are assessed nine times before they actually receive service. So this actually reduces the costs of assessments and improves um, the information sharing because it actually develops a common language so that you can get a child accessing services and prioritizing as quickly as possible. So if you look at continuity of care, it's really, really important that we identify children as soon as possible. And as part of the um, development efforts of the Collaborative Action Plans, there was over 150 different experts that participated in the development of these Collaborative Action Plans. So essentially, um, it's a huge partnership internationally to make sure that we have good evidence-informed practice for uh, interventions for children and youth. As I said, it was designed for integration, so service sector integration to try and improve outcomes. And it also enhances um, early intervention, care planning, as well as assessment. I don't know if, how well you can see that, but this provides just information ab across the child and youth suite. So we start off with um, uh, infant, toddler, and preschool assessment. And then depending on the per particular service sector, so the child, if they're presenting at a mental health facility, they would receive the child and youth mental health screen as well as the child and youth mental health instrument. And then if they were in the education sector, they'd be receiving the INDRI education assessment. And then um, we have different uh, quality of life assessments that I'll be talking about briefly. And then we also have uh, a developmental disability instrument for children who are presenting with IQ below 70. And then we have uh, the child and youth emergency screener as well as pediatric home care. And then I'll be showing you some data on our youth just justice custodial facilities uh, instruments as well shortly. So just to give you an overview, um, we're just in the pilot stage uh, in the development efforts. We received uh, poverty reduction um, grants to improve outcomes for uh, babies, toddlers, and preschoolers who are at risk for attachment issues, um, caregiver distress, um, young motherhood, uh, low birth weight. And so we're developing an instrument for uh, children under 47 months of age. And we have different uh, collaborative action plans that are, um, we've uh, implemented. And it's used uh, across multiple settings, including child care, um, home visiting program for infants, as well as um, community-based, as well as inpatient, inpatient services. And so this allows us opportunities to really identify these kids early and get them the treatment that they need, as well as their families, because we know how difficult it can be for when a family or a parent is having a, a psychiatric illness and how they parent their own baby. So those children are very at risk. Um, so it is also part of a school readiness initiative to try and prepare that child for good, attentive um, approaches in the uh, school system. The Child and Youth Mental Health Screener is the shortest of the instruments, and it essentially screens uh, for mental health uh, and addiction issues. And this is being used in many of our schools in the province of Ontario. And it has a, uh, what we call a service urgency algorithm. And uh, what happens is after um, an assessment is completed, mm -hmm. There are a variety of scales that you can look at pre-post for very brief intervention, but you can also have a service urgency algorithm that uh, ranges from zero to six, and anything above three or more indicates a higher level of service urgency, whereas a one would be more psychoeducational for the family, whereas um, a, a six would be uh, immediate concern and um, triage to um, either more intensive services or some other type of um, um, in-family uh, intensive care. And that's for 4 to 18 years of age. And then we have, uh, similar to the adult uh, versions, that it's danger to self, danger to others, as well as um, we have information on safety issues re related to the family problems and family placement breakdown, which is often um, a very um, significant trigger for service delivery. In addition to that, we have the emergency screener for psychiatry for children and youth. And this is for children and youth who actually present at emergency departments. If, you're, if they're young, they tend to be presenting for aggressive and behavioral problems. If they're older, they tend to be presenting with suicide and self-harm. And so this provides um, a comprehensive assessment um, or comprehensive screening uh, to assist in triaging uh, a child either to um, more community resources in the community or in patient services. And again, this is for age four to 18. 
The Child and Youth Mental Health Instrument is the oldest of the children and youth instruments, and it's for 4 to 18, but it's a comprehensive assessment. And it's used uh, across um, the province of Ontario as part of standard of care for children and youth who are, have been referred to a mental health facility, a hospital, or um, some other agency. We also have contact agencies which actually provide triaging. They would fit, actually complete the screener and then triage and prioritize to um, agencies who provide the, the actual intervention. So there isn't a requirement that the, the assessment is done in two different places. The information is shared so that there is no rep repetition or duplication of services. And then we have the CHIME DD, which is a Child and Youth Mental Health and Developmental Disability Instrument. And that's for um, kids, again, 4 to 18 years of age, but it's for uh, children with IQs below 70. So they have um, a lot of different needs, and I'll be showing you some data around the differences between um, children uh, with IQs over 70 versus under 70. And essentially it has uh, 23 caps, and this is, allows for care planning, and it may be around injurious behavior or accessibility and mobility um, issues um, with respect to that. There's also, um, similar to the Child and Youth Mental Health Instrument, there's an algorithm embedded in each of the CHIME and the CHIME DD, and it provides you a score of zero to five with respect to resource allocation. So uh, it identifies children and youth who are, require less services based on their presenting problems and those that tend to have more uh, extensive requirements in terms of inpatient uh, services, uh, the higher score indicating uh, more intensive services. And then we have the adolescent supplement, and it's uh, essentially used for children. It is triggered off um, the child and youth mental health instrument as well as a developmental disability instrument. It's essentially for kids over 12 years of age, and it focuses more on issues related to sexuality, uh, issues related to substance use, and more mature behaviors. Uh, the clinician can choose to opt in and actually um, administer this for children under the age of 12 if they're also presenting with more mature behaviors that they have uh, concerns regarding, such as substance use problems. Or the or a child may be actually a parent, um, and so um, even at the age of uh, 12 years, or 11 years of age, and so um, it would be implemented then. We also have an addiction supplement that's triggered off the Child and Youth Mental Health Instrument, and this addiction supplement uh, looks at issues related to substance use, tobacco, gambling, as well as gaming. And video gaming is one of the number one addictions um, upcoming um, in children and youth, and it's caused uh, some significant problems in social interaction and ability to maintain um, uh, social connectedness. Uh, and it's also been uh, very much related to uh, in increased incidence in anxiety as well as suicidal ideation as a result of um, lack of connectedness with um, peers. Then we have the NRI education, and it's in the pilot stage, and it's for um, schools. And essentially, it um, identifies and assesses uh, learning disabilities, speech and language issues, gross and fine motor problems, as well as communication, uh, as well as resilience and uh, the like. And it has 17 different collaborative action plans that are identified within that assessment system. And in the future, what we're going to be doing with this instrument as well as the Youth Justice Custodial S Instrument is actually develop youth caps so that they can actually get some ownership in terms of um, being able to address some of their own mental he health issues based on evidence-informed care. And then we have the Youth Justice Custodial S Facilities Instrument. And um, it is essentially for uh, youth in conflict with the law. And these are, we call um, in Ontario, secure custody facilities, um, but it's, it's essentially jail for children um, 12 and older. And uh, essentially, this is to assess uh, mental health issues um, with youth um, who are in conflict with the law and have actually been charged and sentenced. And many of uh, the youth um, in Ontario have major mental health issues. And I can show you a few of um, the findings that we have um, uh, experienced as a result of uh, comparison between youth justice facilities, inpatients, and outpatient care. We also have the subjective quality of life, and this is um, actually has been approved by Accreditation Canada as best practice. And so uh, a variety of different agencies and organizations are implementing it to get the quality of life of the child 
uh, to understand um, where, the, where they are at in terms of um, their treatment goals as well as how, how well they felt about the treatment process that they experienced. And then we have the uh, NRI Family Quality of Life, and um, it essentially is for uh, the family to uh, engage in an understanding of what their quality of life is based on mental health uh, issues uh, within their um, family. And uh, this is available in both inpatient and outpatient, and it's in pilot um, stage. So the collaborative action plans um, are triggered off uh, the assessment instrument, and they essentially target um, those, it's a case finding methodology in which to identify imminent risk for uh, children and youth. And so it allows the actual assessor at their fingertips as soon as they push submit to actually have the information available, available to them for care planning. So this is one of the big important hot topics that people really enjoy about the NRI assessment systems. Similarly, the scales also provide pre-post outcomes so that you can actually evaluate your, your programs. And so there's a variety of different um, scales that are related to the child and youth instruments that you can compare and contrast across service sectors. And then you can monitor impact and you can look at dashboarding so that you can uh, look at pre-post even within individuals as well as um, uh, between uh, agencies. We can also identify who's the most expensive and least expensive child or youth in the service system and that allows opportunities to program and develop um, better allocation of resources depending on um, the particular child or family that's um, presenting. And then in the future, we don't have it yet, but quality indicators to identify agencies and organizations so that they can compare and contrast uh, for benchmarking uh, across provinces and, um, and uh, countries. Each agency gets um, a, a client profile as well as information with respect to using the results. So a, a completed assessment in combination with the scales and the collaborative action plans allow you an opportunity to have uh, support with respect to triaging, um, uh, support uh, treatment planning as well as referrals and tracking change. And I'm just going to um, provide uh, just a quick view of um, some of the results since I only have a min one minute. <laughs> and so we did, uh, we looked at uh, secure custody cases in patients and outpatients. And um, there are smaller numbers in comparison to the adults, but they give you a little bit of a tidbit of what's going on in terms of uh, a comparison across service sectors. If you look at um, this particular um, uh, graph, it shows you uh, information regarding trauma. As you can see, um, in terms of imminent safety risk, uh, it is the youth justice kids that seem to be uh, more traumatized than even inpatient and outpatients, at least for the uh, high risk. Um, and in terms of moderate, it uh, appears to be um, outpatient in terms of um, uh, previous trauma that they need treatment with. In terms of harm to others, as you can see, um, with respect to YJ, har a risk to harm to others is much higher in the YJ, the youth justice um, uh, uh, population and compared to uh, the inpatient outpatient for moderate and for high risk. Um, there's, uh, again, the same uh, pattern, but less so for inpatient. Um, similarly, suicide and self-harm, uh, the inpatients are actually at highest risk, but for moderate risk, it's actually the youth justice um, that is of most concern. In terms of interpersonal conflict, uh, in t uh, to reduce conflict within a specific domain, it's fairly even across the board, but it's actually inpatients that have the highest uh, interpersonal conflict needs in terms of care planning. As you can see, for substance abuse and tobacco, uh, almost 98% of the youth justice population had some type of substance use problem in comparison to the inpatient and outpatients. And then in terms of prevention of long-term tobacco use, similarly, the youth justice was higher than the other two groups. In terms of other CAPS, transition planning was required most often for kids um, in the youth justice compared to the other uh, subpopulations uh, with respect to um, medication review as well as weight management. Uh, the issue is more um, problematic in inpatients. And then for medication adherence, it was outpatient issues. Then we also looked at inpatients and outpatients in terms of comparison of uh, CAPS that are triggered 
And so if you look um, here, there's approximately 8,000 within the community, and for inpatient, it's about 685, and for intellectual disability, it's 554 versus 103 in inpatient. And essentially, if you look at the results here, you can see inpatients by far are much higher than outpatients on the Child and Youth Mental Health Instrument, which is what you would expect across almost all of the CAPs. So the major areas that are of most risk are social and peer relationships, interpersonal conflict, as well as uh, education problems. So those are the areas that you really need to focus on in terms of uh, differences between inpatients and outpatients. If you look at the um, developmental disabilities, so children and youth in developmental um, inpatients versus outpatients, again, you see the same pattern with inpatients requiring much more uh, intensive services uh, as we go, and uh, injurious behavior and education support seem to be the most uh, important areas in which to focus on when you're um, addressing uh, inpatient developmental disability services. And then if you compare and contrast uh, the child and youth uh, inpatient versus um, that with IQs over 70 versus under 70. As you can see, um, with respect to mental health, um, they require, um, the mental health kids tend to require more uh, control um, uh, interventions as well as suicide and self-harm uh, interventions and then support services for discharge. Conversely, the developmental uh, children require more issues with life skills, communication, um, uh, strength-based interventions, as well as medication review, which is consistent with what one would expect. And then if you compare outpatient services, as you can see, the Chime DD outpatients have significantly more problems in terms of life skills, communication, strengths, as well as medication adherence. And then trauma is more uh, related to child and youth uh, mental health issues, as well as um, parenting problems. And then just to summarize, um, the, uh, what you can do is utilize this data to actually customize um, output for annual reports and accreditation. And this has actually had an opportunity to allow agencies and organizations to um, uh, receive more uh, grant funding and services as a result of showing uh, best practice and value for dollar, which has been happening in Ontario. So that's exciting. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shannon.